Welcome everyone to the private stakeholder collaboration, the key to unlocking finance for green growth and resilience in partnership with FSD Africa. We are very glad to have you here with us today. We would like to start by thanking our sponsors, JP Morgan, Credit Suisse, Peng Ang, Moody's ESG Solutions, Luxembourg, Green Exchange, City, Refinitiv, BNP Paribas, IHS Market, Alliance Bernstein, FSD Africa, Inter-American Development Bank, ICMA, Mizuro, IFC, and Ashurst. Before we start, I just have a few important reminders. Um, the Q&A box is to ask questions, other comments or queries to the chat. There is live interpretation in Portuguese, Spanish, Mandarin, and French. Please look for the headphone icon. All sessions are being recorded. You can listen until November um, on Swapcard. And please use the cool tools on offer. Network with thousands of attendees and check our virtual booths. For media um, interviews, please visit the Climate Bonds virtual booth to arrange them. And I would like to thank our amazing speakers, Mark Nathir from FSD Africa, Nicola Mustitia um, from CDC Group, Manisha Gulati from Coali Coalition for Urban Transitions, Emmanuel Eta Etaderi, sorry, FMDQ, Yasser Monsef from um, Autorité, Maura Kane du Marche de Copu, sorry, and Peter Odengo from the National Treasury of Kenya. Over to you, Mark. Thank you, Letitia, and uh, thank you to everybody for um, agreeing to share some time with us. Uh, good morning, if you're in London and uh, Casablanca, and uh, good afternoon, if you're pretty much uh, anywhere else. Um, it's a great pleasure to be with you, and thank you again for joining. And thank you very much to the Climate Bonds Initiative, not just for laying on this uh, very important event, but also um, speaking as FSD Africa for their partnership over, over several years now. We've been working very closely with the Climate Bonds Initiative on green bond development, in particularly in Kenya and Nigeria, but in other parts of Africa as well. It's been an exciting journey with the uh, Climate Bonds Initiative. Um, and <clears throat> I think together we've seen um, a lot of progress in this incredibly important market. Um, and, uh, you know, the one thing that I would just say is how important I think it is for these standards, which is kind of how I think about CBI, to be maintained with this enormous interest in, in green investing. It's incredibly important that we keep to quality standards as well as uh, as well as the volume of capital that we're hoping to to crowd into green finance. So I wanted to say, to say thank you particularly to, to Climate Bonds Initiative for for that partnership and long may that continue. We have a fantastic panel um, and um, I would like to go straight into talking to them because uh, it would be uh, much more interesting to hear them than uh, to hear me. So um, without uh, any further ado, I'm going to ask uh, Yassir Mamsi from the uh, Moroccan Capital Market Authority um, to, to start the proceedings. Uh, good morning, Yassir, Yassir. It's good to, good to have you with us today. Um, you're a regulator. And uh, regulators principally are uh, concerned with um, supervision and keeping the market stable and so on. But they also have a responsibility to develop the market as well. So I'd be very interested to hear from you if, uh, if you could say, what, what are the specific examples of the measures that the uh, Moroccan Capital Market Authority uh, has been promoting in order to drive green investment? Thank you, Mark, and uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, well, it is it is a, a, a real uh, a real challenge uh, of the regulator to strike a balance between the, the opposing tendencies you spoke about. So, as a regulator, we're mainly uh, concerned, and our uh, core mission is to protect savings, uh, to oversee market actors, but we have also. Uh, to an increasing extent, the duty to ensure the development of uh, market and the promotion of products that are that are aligned and respond to uh, to um, to capital markets needs. So, because the 
the uh, the market role after all is to finance the economy so we always struggle to find uh, uh, an adequate balance between these uh, opposing tendencies and this balance is uh, is uh, is dynamic and there is no magic formula to solve it uh, there is another dimension is that in uh, as a regulator we seek uh, alignment with international standards but we also have to take into account uh, local realities of our markets and, and uh, supervised entities. Um, so uh, maybe we can talk about the sustainable finance journey, which illustrates uh, perfectly how how we dealt with these uh, with these factors and what what was the approach that uh, that we adopted to uh, to solve the equation. But uh, in a nutshell, as a regulator, you have to always listen to the ecosystem and market players to take into account various perspectives. Uh, you have to coordinate your efforts with uh, all the other policy makers and regulators and uh, standard setters in order to have a coordinated uh, approach uh, and keep up with international uh, trends and, and standards. So uh, co cooperation is, is paramount in, in this endeavor. <clears throat> that, that's great. And would you be able to point to a specific example of regulatory change that uh, that Morocco has introduced that that uh, you're particularly proud of? Yeah. Uh, well, I, 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 as I said, I, I can cite the the experience in the field of sustainable finance. I'll just point out a few a few uh, factors or or important milestones. So uh, Morocco has. A Adopted sustainable development in general as a, as a as a core dimension of its development. So uh, it, it has been embedded in the kingdom's uh, institution and declined in operational policies such as the um, the very ambitious uh, sustainable energies policy. So uh, the but the the effective journey in sustainable finance per se started in the COP22. Uh, where uh, uh, there was a heavy mobilization of all the uh, the stakeholders, and we con we concluded uh, a, uh, a roadmap for fostering the development of sustainable finance in Morocco. So uh, there was the, the AMMC, the Capital Market Regulator, the Central Bank, the Ministry of Finance, and the series of of uh, stakeholders, and each of them took uh, a series of engagements. So as, uh, uh, as, as the regulator, uh, we right away started de developing, developing measures. So uh, we, we produced guidelines on how, to, uh, on how to adopt, on how to issue sustainable finance instruments, such as green bonds and sustainability bonds. Uh, re very recently, we issued uh, guidelines on gender bonds in collaboration with FSD Africa. Uh, we, we, we also uh, deployed a regu uh, regulations for sustainable finance. For example, uh, we introduced in 2019 uh, the mandatory ESG reporting for issuers. And we also use a lot of um, capacity building and actors engagement. So uh, as an example here again, uh, in collaboration with C CBI and FSD Africa, we uh, we organized two workshops this year uh, one for the for the uh, financial auditors to be able to <clears throat> to certify uh, or produce second party opinions on sustainable finance instruments and one for issuers to uh, raise their awareness again and give them uh, practical aspects to uh, to uh, issue uh, to issue green bonds but what what is important to point, to point out is that this endeavor of developing sustainable finance is not just for the sake to be trendy and to, uh, to, uh, to brag about. It's really a fundamental dimension of uh, the, the kingdom's development. For example, I can give the, the example of the, um, of the automobile industry, which has been develop, developing at a fairly rapid pace these years and, and, and became the first uh, contributor to Moroccan exports. So here we have a target of reaching a very high 
uh, integration rate. Uh, the, 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 the ministry uh, targets 80% integration rate. So now we are, we are at 60%, but we reach uh, um, a glass ceiling for, for, for reaching the 80%. We need to be able to produce components that, uh, uh, and that are uh, uh, heavy consumers of energy. So sustainable energy is the way to be able to be competitive on these markets and, and reach those high integration rates. And gradually, uh, sustainable energies need capital and the capital market is here to back this up and, and provide adequate financing for all these, these projects. Uh, yes, yeah, so thank you very much. So that sounds like it's been firstly a very busy period for you. Um, and it sounds very much as though Morocco is, is very much open for business uh, for green financing. So thank you for that. You said um, just at the beginning um, in your opening remarks, you said that um, you were very mindful of international standards and that uh, your, your focus is to try to, to uh, adopt those where possible. But you also needed to be mindful about local uh, differences as well. And I just wondered if there are examples of regulatory pressures um, coming from the outside um, around uh, ESG, for example, that you think um, may be more appropriate for more advanced financial markets and less appropriate for Morocco? Well, uh, as, a re uh, as, a, as a regulator and as, as a member of uh, various international networks that work, in, uh, that work on the sustainable finance, such as uh, SBN or, uh, or, or other networks, we are all, all, uh, always uh, following the international trends and evolutions. Uh, what I can say is that up to now, we have a fairly sound uh, framework with regards to issuers. So uh, we have a very developed framework for how to issue uh, sustainable finance instruments, green, social sustainability, gender bonds, and, and, uh, and others. Uh, we have a sound framework for verification of and credibility credibility of issues. So uh, even if the, the international standards generally make the, uh, the second party opinion or the external review as a recommendation, we adopt it as a mandatory. So you cannot issue a sustainable, uh, a, a labeled instrument unless you have uh, a third party review to back it up. Uh, we introduced also uh, yearly ESG reporting, as I said, for issuers. So we think now that the, the issuer side is, is uh, mature enough. Uh, so the next priority is ESG investing. So uh, we will be targeting investors to try to foster adopting ESG uh, standard uh, ESG factors in their practices. This should be done through uh, incentives uh, giving them incentives to adopt those standards to through guidance also on how to do so and uh, through uh, transparency on uh, their their practices in their in their field so uh, this becomes uh, a, comp a, a competition factor and and uh, and the dissemination of, of these practices all this should be done through a progressive and inclusive approach uh, and in all this endeavor, uh, again, collaboration with various partners and stakeholders is, is key to unlock opportunities uh, and optimize efforts and resources uh, that are needed. Fantastic. Uh, yes, yeah, so thanks so much. Uh, we could go on talking for a while, but we need to move on now to Nicola. Um, thank, thank you, you uh, very much. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's very, very interesting indeed. Um, a, a, a view from, from uh, Casablanca there. Um, so Nicola, um, you work for the UK's Development Finance Institution, CDC. Um, could you, uh, obviously, you, like FSD Africa, are very mindful of the UK government's um, particular uh, interest in green finance, particularly in the run-up to COP26. Could you just, just give us a little bit of a snapshot on what um, CDC is doing to support um, the global effort towards COP26? Sure, and, and thanks a lot, Mark, and good morning and good afternoon, everybody. 
So I guess, yeah, COP26 for us clearly, you know, is a key priority, but also a key opportunity. And uh, clearly everybody also, you know, has seen the recent IPCC report, which made very clear, you know, what is at stake and particularly in African markets, which obviously are core uh, to the markets that we invest in. Um, and we've also seen um, the IEA's, um, you know, first uh, net zero uh, scenario recently as well, which also makes clear how we need to respond to this in terms of the economic transformation um, that is required. I mean, one of the points that I wanted to highlight, which is particularly important um, for, for CDC, and I think which Yasia also referred to is about the local context. So for us, it was very important to develop a climate change approach and a climate change strategy that acknowledges that the transformation in the markets that we invest in in Africa looks different, you know, to more developed markets, given the low kind of baseline, you know, of historic uh, emissions, but also the particular exposure uh, to climate change um, risks and that's why we uh, developed and launched our climate change strategy uh, last year um, which is basically very mindful of this sort of local local context and which sets out our approach in terms of how we want to support the objectives of the Paris Agreement around the free building blocks of uh, achieving a net zero investment portfolio by uh, 2050, supporting a just transition uh, for workers and communities and thirdly increasing investments uh, in adaptation um, and resilience. And for us what it's really clear is that this sort of broader strategic approach which um, basically influences all the investment decisions um, that we make. So, um, for example, since 2017, we invested around uh, $1.2 billion uh, in climate finance. And basically, we have a commitment to deliver more climate finance, you know, going forward. So, for example, for 2021, we have set ourselves a target that 30% of all of our commitments will be in areas that support uh, climate impact. And then on the other side of the coin, which obviously is also really important, um, we are also um, excluding new investments in the vast majority uh, of the most emitting uh, fossil fuel uh, value chain uh, sectors um, as well. And then if I can come on to the adaptation uh, and resilience uh, side, given that it's such a core part of our strategy as well, um, we are basically here um, doing increasing work with our portfolio companies to improve their resilience, identify physical climate risks, and also target our investments towards adaptation and resilience um, solutions. And some of the investments um, that we made uh, already really illustrate, I guess, that sort of impact that green finance can have on, you know, uh, climate change action, but also people's lives. So, for example, through our investment uh, in, in Global Egg, which is an independent power producer uh, in Africa, we are supporting a range of renewable energy projects across the continent so that, for example, includes Melindi, which is a solar plant in Kenya, uh, which is located in a region where load shedding, um, you know, is rampant, where demand will increase. But for us, it's also really important to increasingly support innovation in the renewable energy space as well. So, for example, Kuamba, which is a renewable energy plus storage project uh, in Mozambique, recently broke ground as well and um, is probably one of the first, um, you know, utility scale a private IPPs in Africa with a completely renewable and storage um, uh, solution. Um, but on the other hand, obviously, we have the energy access challenge in many African countries as well. So what's important in the green finance space for us too, is to also support along the kind of energy value chain in terms of off grid and mini grid companies as well. Um, we invested in Mcopa a couple of years ago and recently also made an investment um, in, in green light planet. So for us, it's really important and key to work with our shareholders which you know is the UK government, uh, as as you mentioned, to collaborate with stakeholders um, to really increase. Uh, green finance, but also, which I think is very important to make sure that we take climate change into account across all the investment decisions, um, uh, basically, that we make. And for us, you know, the next 10 years, and for everybody, the next 10 years is absolutely crucial in terms of climate action and, and broader SDGs. So, um, yeah, we're really looking forward to collaborating with a range of stakeholders uh, to deliver on these needs and really demonstrate how you can decouple, you know, economic growth uh, from you know emissions in practice. Nicola, thank you so much. That's uh, that's very interesting. And one one thing I wanted to ask you. So obviously, uh, the development finance institutions are kind of pathfinders for 
for investment. That's what they should be doing. And um, I wanted to ask you whether you were seeing much evidence of what, what we might call the pure private sector coming in behind the DFIs into into green investment opportunities. Um, and if there's time and you have about three minutes, um, just to say a little bit about how we can start to skew some of that private investment away from, in a way, the easier stuff, which is renewable energy, and into the more difficult piece, which is natural capital, transport, and some of those other things as well. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, both very, very good question. I try to keep it brief. So to answer, I guess, your, your first uh, question. So we definitely see increased um, private investment, um, you know, coming into the green sectors, you know, across across the continent. I mean, one area I would like just to highlight um, is that there are clear, you know, regional um, differences, obviously, across, across the continent um, in particular. So a lot of the green investment that we're seeing, obviously, uh, is, is coming into you know northern africa obviously we have yes here in terms of how he's setting out the regulatory framework there or southern africa and and kenya as well which i'm sure you know peter will will come on to but i think it's really important to know you know where where the investment is basically concentrated but we see some good indicators that more private investment uh, will will follow uh, into green sectors you know we've seen more and more investors uh, committing to net zero targets um clearly that in order for that to be credible it has to uh, translate into increased allocation to green assets as part of a broader portfolio construction you know strategy to move away from being a kind of niche uh, topic and and also clearly the needs in many african countries for green investment um, to support climate action and economic growth um, are massive um, and then if i can come on briefly to your question on um, I guess how DFIs can play a role to um, expand green investment beyond renewable energy. Before I can come on to this, again, I think to highlight, I think that there are clear regional um, differences within the renewable energy space. So again, you know, a lot of large um, scale private IPPs are located in Southern and, and Northern Africa, you know, Egypt, uh, Morocco, you know, South Africa, but we see increased growth in other markets as well, such as Kenya and Tanzania, you you know, Mozambique, Ethiopia, Ghana, and so on. But I think there's still lots more capital needs and renewable energy in this space. And then I talked a bit about the need for innovation within renewable energy finance as well, where I think DFIs have a key role to play. So that, for example, includes storage with the Kuamba project I just mentioned, but also transmission and distribution, which is absolutely key to integrate more renewables over time. Um, all of that said, um, DFIs um, very much have a, a core role um, to increase um, green investments, and that's why our climate change strategy, again, that we launched last year, purposely set out the opportunities that we see across across the green finance space. So for us, the key priorities here include, for example, agroforestry and broader forestry, building on some of the forestry investments we have in West Africa. It includes green green buildings as well, which are core to decarbonization. And here we made an investment recently in diversity in, in South Africa for green buildings, but also things like sustainable building materials, uh, clean tech manufacturing, you mentioned urban transport, electrification of transport, and another really important area in the financial services space for us, given the importance of financial services is, uh, you know, to support the decarbonization of the real economy is also increased, you know, directed lending opportunities to financial institutions and also increasingly exploring how we can support green trade uh through our financing um facilities and a last area and that's my, my my last point would be around adaptation and resilience um which i think uh is an is a topic that has been on the table you know for 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 many years in terms of the increased investment needs there um so the topic is not new but it still remains unaddressed but this uh, is a key priority for us. And last year, we launched a DFI Plus Adaptation and Resilience Collaborative with most G7 DFIs to really make sure we mobilize more private investment in adaptation and resilience. Okay, Nicola, thank you very much. Uh, just to point that out that there are lots of very varied challenges, both regional and, and sectoral. So thank you so much for that, uh, that uh, contribution. Right, we're going to stay in the same uh, time zone, more or less. Um, and we're going to go to Lagos. Um, so Emmanuel, um, uh, Emmanuel um, Tadari, thank you for joining us. Um, you, you are uh, working for FMDQ and the exchange. And, and so I guess um, one thing I wanted to ask you to explain to us is what is the role of 
this kind of infrastructure and exchange um, in supporting um, uh, green finance. Thank you very much, Mark. And uh, it's nice to be part of this very, uh, um, you know, well put together panel on uh, speaking to a very important uh, topic. Just to say that it's actually FMDQ group and the exchange is just a part of the group. And uh, for the subsidiaries, apart from the exchange, uh, you have the private markets, FMDQ private markets. You have FMDQ Clare, which is the central counterparty clearing house for risk management services. And you, you, you have, you have um, the technology company, IQX, and then you have FMDQ depository. Uh, however, to speak to your question about the role of this sort of uh, financial market infrastructure in you know, the, the green space, I think one of the key things we've done from right from 2017 was to launch a sustainable finance subcommittee. And from that sustainable finance subcommittee, uh, which was actually launched by the then uh, uh, um, treasurer of the IFC, uh, Jin Tonghua, in, uh, in, in Lagos and uh, Nigeria, uh, we've gone ahead to also partner with you, with your institution, Mark, with FFSD Africa, and with Climate Bonds Initiative to launch the Nigerian Green Bond Market Development Program. That program has been running for three years, and through the program of supported corporate issuances, as well as supported the uh, sovereign uh, 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 issuers of green bonds. So we, we have worked with um, the different departments and ministries and agencies of government to pull together, uh, 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 create a pipeline of projects that could be funded or financed through the green bonds uh, uh, market, if you like. So to, to date, Nigeria has about 55 or 56 billion Naira of issuance. This is both from the corporate and the sovereign space. And our, our work and our, our goal is to expand this, to increase more. Of course, there's a lot that we can do more in this space in terms of you know, creating the environment to encourage more issuers and to also encourage investors in green instruments. So our work is to do a lot of capacity building, trainings, and, and then market development, creating products also, and providing the platform for the listing of this instrument on our exchange. Of mm -hmm. course, since we have the full financial mar uh, capital market uh, uh, complement of, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, uh, you know, uh, complementary services, including depositors, as, as I mentioned, that clearing uh, service, all of these will have to create that ecosystem that will enhance or precipitate more issuances, more listings, and expand you know, the frontiers of green, green finance in Nigeria. Thank you, Emmanuel. That's very, very important points about the conduits of capital. And um, so ex yeah. the exchange's role in, in coordinating and also developing products for investors to invest into, very, very critical. Um, Lagos is one of the world's most vulnerable cities. Um, and I was reading recently that the um, economic exposure, the financial risk attached to Lagos is $130 billion. So my question to you would be, with that much risk, how can you hope to crowd in private investment into addressing some of those things? Uh, you, you hit the nail on the head there. Lagos is one of the 11 cities globally that have been identified as being uh, below sea level and likely to uh, go finally on there in about 40 years or so. Uh, Lagos is really exposed to the challenge of rising sea level and climate change uh, and needs to take ac active steps. So that is why FMDQ, partnering with both government and private sector stakeholders, have been trying to refocus the attention of the financial markets, especially the key players, the banks and all the uh, uh, key actors in the financial market space to pull together finance to fund and to invest in green projects. Uh, first of all, to understand the risk that they face if they don't do that. Because as I mentioned to you, maybe one of our earlier chats, most of the big banks have, for example, their head offices and big investments in locations along the shores of the Atlantic Ocean that Lagos actually is, is, is exposed to. Uh, and they, they, they face both physical and transitional risk. The, 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 another key important factor to note is that Nigerian banks are exposed to fossil fuels to the extent that about 36% of their loan book is for that sector. So they face the kind of transition risk and that we have been identified as part of the issue brought about by climate change. And so our role is to 
you know, pull in stakeholders, especially from the private sector, uh, to to get them to understand the risk first, and then to see the need to put in their their their, their, their resources, both financial and otherwise, behind you know climate change issues. Um, we 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 the, the challenges are enormous. The the the, the amount required to tackle climate change in Lagos, as you mentioned, one thirty billion dollars is quite large, given that that is about a third of our GDP as a country. Uh, but we we have made efforts over the last three years, and we're making in, we're doing uh, uh, more on uh, increasing our, our efforts in this space to get the attention of the private. Uh, 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 investors, uh, those, both, both those who are currently involved and those who are new to this space to bring their resources to support, you know, and invest in green product, green inst instruments. You know, uh, we, we, we are trying to see how we can pull finance into green projects. And that is one of the key reasons why uh, League, uh, F FMDQ uh, worked with the United Nations Environment Program to support the establishment of the Financial Center for Sustainability Lagos, which, as you know, is a part of other financial centers across the world. And our key focus is to pull private capital into green. That's a great uh, segue, isn't it? I mean, you're, you're also, FMDQ is also the secretariat, I think, to FC4S Lagos, which yes, is a, a, a fantastic role for FMDQ to be playing. Um, you spoke very, can I just in two minutes that we have left uh, for you, Emmanuel, you have, you spoke about that, that transitional risk, which is obviously very pronounced when it comes to an oil um, economy like, um, like um, Nigeria. Do you think incentives are strong enough? And actually, do you think, in fact, we should be looking at legislation? legislation in order to drive the changes that we know are necessary? I, I, I think uh, that's a very important question. Um, incentives are, are good, but they're not sufficient to address the kind of challenges they were facing. I think one of our conversations talked about the need for a carbon tax and how that could uh, essentially shape behavior uh, of the actors in the, in, in the market. Uh, but uh, as as we've learned and as we've seen, that may not be sufficient enough. We beyond having carbon tax, the first thing in having a tax is how properly is this tax being implemented? You know, is is it being enforced? You know, and are the key actors responding to to this tax? Is it having a desired impact? So beyond having a carbon tax in place and ensuring that it is implemented, I think the better thing to do is to start actually from the grassroots level to educate people and create more awareness and sensitization on how their daily actions and behavior affects the environment they're living in. So one of the key things we plan to do is to start even from the primary stage of education to create that awareness, sensitization, build knowledge you know, in capacity, people to understand the impact of their actions on the environment they live in and how that is having a long-term effect on the economic sustainability and development of the country. Mm. So we're building that uh, competency around, you know, educating people from right from the schools level to across all sectors of the economy, making them aware. Once you create that awareness, that consciousness, then people will shape their daily actions and that will help to, you know, help Nigeria to meet its commitments to the Paris Ag Agreement eventually. Emmanuel, thank you so much. So much to do, so little time to do it in. <laughs> um, but uh, very best of luck with all of that challenge um, and uh, with, uh, pulling Lagos out of uh, out of that that sort of problem. I'm going to turn to Manisha um, and uh, just the introduction to the concept of a city in in peril um, is something that I know Manisha has been um, thinking about for quite some time, um, working for the Coalition for Urban Transitions. Um, Manisha, thank you for joining us. Um, when we are thinking about green investment and the green economy and transitional risks and so on, why is what's so important about cities? Thank you, Mark, for having me. Um, I'm going to begin with what Nicola said, the latest IPCC report. The report essentially makes it very clear that we need immediate and large scale emission reductions. Otherwise, we're not going to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees and even two degrees is beyond reach. But that's where cities actually come in. We can get these emissions reductions uh, going in cities. We have today a range of technically feasible, widely available low carbon solutions in areas like transport, buildings, waste, etc., which reduce emissions by almost 90% by 2050. 
Um, now, when we talk about cities on the African continent, these green solutions actually present an opportunity. They can help us tackle some of the basic and day-to-day -day challenges that people on the continent face in cities. Um, air pollution, pollution of water, pollution from waste. We're looking at tr removing traffic congestion. We're looking at providing basic services more efficiently and effectively. Um, statistics say that in absolute terms, the urban population on the African continent has grown 2000% between 1950 and 2015. And we are looking at a billion more people on the continent in urban areas by 2050. We already have a huge infrastructure backlog and we will need more infrastructure to cater to this population. So when we talk about African cities, green investments are actually going to help us overcome this infrastructure backlog and make cities so much more productive, far quicker and far cheaper. Manisha, thank you very much. And perhaps it's also just worth emphasizing that, of course, cities are, are the place where public and private really really do come together aren't they i mean that's that's yeah. we, the the, this, the uh, title of this session was really about partnerships between public and private yeah. and that's where you've got to have and um, the state and, and the private sector working in, in lockstep um, very much so thank you um so uh, manisha the work that you your organization and we have been doing on um on cities recently is really about making the economic case for investment in in urban in green urban development and, and showcasing examples of the kind of financial innovations that you think could uh, or that we think could help to front load the investment that we know that cities are going to to need um i get the fact that cities are places where we need to invest in things like uh, that don't produce revenues um it's going to be hard to get that money into into that kind of sector isn't it what are yeah. your thoughts um, Mark, you spoke about Lagos, that those numbers are mind boggling. But, um, you know, the truth is that the continent's commercial hubs um, and as many as 15 African capitals are at extreme risk from climate change. Most African mm -hmm. cities are flood risk hotspots and we need investments in them urgently to make them resilient. Um, we're not going to make this happen without private sector investment, but investors are actually struggling with a range of obstacles when it comes to investing in resilient infrastructure. Um, and some of this is not just about resilience. It's actually a, a good many of these barriers apply to urban infrastructure in general. We've got a, a number of cities which have budget deficits, they lack credit worthiness because they don't have reliable and meaningful revenue streams. We've got a whole load of restrictions by national governments that prevent cities from raising their own funds or from doing land value capture. And um, there are few African cities where we have single elected authorities which exercise economic control or uh, provide uniform services in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a planned manner. Now, in this situation, we bring in the concept of resilience. Um, climate risk per se is often undervalued when we talk about infrastructure investments. But in this situation, the revenue streams to pay back the financing of the project is difficult to come by because cities are not able to make a convincing argument for the benefit of that infrastructure. And um, therefore, the return on investment to those who are who are paying for it. Um, and it also gets us back to that eternally discussed challenge of project preparation, the technical capacity and the upfront costs to prepare projects and to show the resilient, the climate resilient component of infrastructure means that cities are able to offer few ready to go projects to private sector investors. Mark, you're on mute. We're looking to launch that report uh, towards the end of the month, I, I know, so I, I don't want you to give too much away, mm -hmm. but what was it that most excited you about the findings? So um, our report um, identifies how action by national governments can remove barriers to green investments in cities, particularly for uh, private sector investments. We also look at financing instruments that could be used to invest in green infrastructure. 
based on a city's financial strength and legal authority. So essentially what we are saying is that there's something for every type of city. Cities can attract private sector investment. But what excites me most, Mark, is the point that, um, that we have in the report on the economic benefits of these green investments. We've looked at three countries, Ethiopia, Kenya, and South Africa, and these countries are very different fundamentally, whether it's the share of urban population or it's the stage of economic development. But what our analysis shows that in, in 35 major cities, in these three countries, green investments have the potential to deliver over a trillion dollars of economic benefits by 2050. And I keep asking myself, I keep thinking, we have 54 countries. If national governments and cities can begin to work together to unlock the urban opportunity, look at the kind of benefits that we're looking at for the continent. If finance or the flow of finance from the private sector is not something that we're going to have to worry about if we can make that happen. And so on that very positive note, so basically what uh, Manisha is saying is that the uh, it's very expensive, but the economic benefit is very great. Um, and so we need to focus on that um, and we need to be creative about how we get the money in in the first place. So on that very positive note, I'm going to now turn to uh, I'm going to say thank you very much, uh, Manisha, and, and for your work over, over the past few months. And I'm going to turn to um, to Peter um, Odengo um, in Kenya um, and just to say that uh, that uh, Kenya has been really very much at the forefront of many of the policy and regulatory changes on green finance um, in recent years. I, I would say that um, Kenya is, is very much a continental uh, market leader in that regard. Um, we have lots to learn from, um, from Kenya. And um, I, I'm going to start, Peter. Firstly, thank you for joining us. Um, it's good to have you. Um, and second, I just wanted to ask you about Kenya's updated NDC. Um, could you just tell us what Kenya is committing to and how much of that NDC is expected to be funded by the private sector? Thank you very much, uh, Mark, and also colleagues. It's also great again to see a team from uh, 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 CBI that we have been working with. Uh, indeed, in our upgraded NDC, as you have just well said that Kenya is a leader, we have already in, uh, upgraded our ambition from the last NDC, which we committed to reduce our emissions by 30% uh, by 2030. But uh, because Kenya, we know very well that it is our responsibility and the country is, uh, is one of the most vulnerable and the problem of climate change at the local level is with us. So the, in our updated NDC, we have, we have already increased our ambition from 30 to 32%, but also we have reduced the year, which because originally we, we took, we, we had a longer period for 30%. So the reason why we did that is because we are committed, we have, enabled, we have developed enabling environments, we have had all the policies which we started from 2009, where we had a very good a comprehensive study which was giving us exactly the cost of climate change, which puts us losing between 2 to 3% annually until we fix the problem. Now, of the current ambitious uh, NDC as upgraded, we need about, uh, we need about 62 billion uh, US dollars to respond to our climate change, uh, to finance our climate change needs. But out of that, Kenya has already committed that we need about, the government has already committed 22% of that. And in average, 30% or 22% of the total cost is already committed. And we expect about 78. This is in line with the international commitments, Paris Agreement, the UNFTPC, the, uh, the Clean Development Mechanism, where our development partners committed to support the developing countries by mobilizing adequate resources as provided for within the Green Climate Fund, $100 million billion per year up to 2020, and also to be able to increase that ambition going to 2030 in order to enable us uh, uh, reach our target of net carbon zero balance. But now of this, the 62 billion, which means that we need to be raising 62, uh, about 
about six billion about six billion dollars a year the government is also committed that about 30 to 40 percent of that is low is they have to mobilize it locally and get our development partners and both from the private sector and also the development partner so why that that is because kenya is also one of the counties that have already pioneered devolving climate finance and devolving climate finance requires effective policy landscape which enables the partners for example i was very happy to hear from manisha and also nicole about the the, the, the development uh, our development partner support and also the role of the private sector because the responding to climate change impacts particularly adaptation uh, it requires huge capital outflow and that significant capital outflow has to come from the private sector only 30 percent is may come from the public sector because the public sector support and finance is also constrained because of the competing needs of the social responsibility but institutions like uh, FSD Africa has been very, very, very handy in trying to support the government in realizing effective policy environment. For example, we are working on the green fiscal incentive policy. And within that green fiscal incentive policy, we have two key outcomes which we are targeting. One is how to establish carbon emission trading scheme within our Nairobi Stock Exchange and also within the region. And also, at the same time, we also need, because we know the, the money that is flowing from the climate landscape coming 2030 to 2050 for the net zero, it's in terms of trillions of US dollars. That kind of flow of resources will require effective institutional framework, which uh, Yasser had already said, we need institutional of framework with the, the private sector have a confidence that they have a, a regulatory framework that will guarantee that flow of such kind of money to finance the needed infrastructure and the social aspect that is required by the government and in this case in our draft green fiscal policy which we are developing now provides for the establishment of green investment bank that green investment bank will be is is going to be taking the load moving towards 2030 as we are approaching the 2050 for the net zero. So when you look at that landscape, yes, we had started our enabling policy environment 209. We had economic impacts of climate change. We have now our national climate change action plan. Now we are in the second one. We are developing the third one. We have our medium term expenditure framework. The national treasury has already was one of the first countries to develop the national climate finance policy, followed by Bangladesh and, uh, and Mexico. And now all those put together is still not enough. We are now, Mark, you know very well how strong we have worked with you to build the capacity of the Kenyan government and line ministries in uh, realizing the potential to issue sovereign green bonds. We must have green debt and we need debt shift so that the counties which are unable, developing counties, must now look at innovative ways of mobilizing additional green finance, sustainable finance in scale and from an alternative sources which are not traditional and respond to the impact of climate change, reducing the emission by well below 2% as required by the Paris Agreement. We need new systems, new structures, new laws, new policies, and new incentives put together will be able to move towards 2050. So, so Peter, I, I... It's probably fair to say that many African countries are not as far advanced as, as Kenya is on green policy and regulatory frameworks. Um, how, how, what, what do you think needs to be done to bring everybody up to speed um, on, uh, on these green fiscal policy uh, frameworks? Because it is, after all, a, a global issue, isn't it? It's no good if Kenya solves the problem, but actually other, other markets don't. We all need to move in lockstep together. What, what do you think needs to be done to, to foster uh, sort of at least regional collaboration across Africa on this? Number one and foremost, we need to create awareness. Awareness among the vertical and the horizontal cross sectors. And this awareness has to start from both sides. One, it has to start from the policy development on the policy aspect. But in terms of the implementation, it starts, it needs to start from the local people, those who are uh, those who are affected by the impact of climate change. 
But this is now what will now galvanize the policy against the action. The two must come together so that we can move in direction. But that local action also requires that countries bordering each other has to come with cross-border policy interactions and awareness integration. This will enable Africa to move as one. And of course, as a result of that, because we see far, that is the reason why we are now mooting the idea of forming Africa Green Finance Coalition, so that they, we learn from each other. We learn from our friends, our development plans, and also we saw the best practices, the path that we have followed should not be followed by those who are following us, because it was long, winding, and treacherous and painful. But now that we are past that stage, Uganda should not follow the same. Nigeria has gone through very good market systems. With this ones, I've been with Nigeria in the sovereign green bond, and we are going to do ours and follow you soon, next month. So what Nigeria has passed, what Morocco has realized, what Kenya says, should uh, Mozambique, Zimbabwe should not follow that route. It is on this accord that we have to work together. We have to have the coalition of counties, people, and indigenous. And that is why I'm also referred as the founder and director of Greening Kenya Initiative. Greening Kenya Initiative is a grassroots platform that is moving the policy to the last person so that in case the politicians, the technocrats, the market players fail to act, then the bottom up of the green champions will force them to act. So this is a two-way approach. access. So, and now we are forming green champion across the counties, the borders. And finally, we yeah. are now devolving climate finance to the local level and financing local climate action so that okay. we now work jointly together. Peter, um, this is a climate bonds conference. So, so I hope you don't mind me asking you the direct question about Kenya's sovereign. Um, is there anything more that you would like to say about that at this stage? <laughs> yes, I'll say it. Great. Kenya is going to issue one of the most, uh, the Dibuk, uh, the sizable benchmark sovereign green bond. We had a green bond approval bond recently. It, we have agreed. We have the pipeline with the support from the FSD Africa. So we are waiting. And the pipelines are also very good in this one. So we will be able. give the world the, the, the presence that they are responsible to tackle the projects which are delivering climate risk, building resilience, tracking the proceeds, ensuring that those which are got go to the right building and reducing the mitigation. We are there now. Our second opinion is very clear. Uh, and finally, I saw a good response from the transport infrastructure. They now want to be, work with us through the sovereign green bond, and we are coming. Very good. Okay, well, um, I'm not going to say you heard it first at, at this conference, but uh, it, it's good to get that uh, that further reassurance that the Kenya sovereign is on its way. So thank you. It is thank you. Way. Thank you so much, Peter. In the diminishing number of minutes that we have left, I wanted to hand back to our panelists if they wanted to make any brief uh, concluding uh, remarks. Um, so, um, uh, Yasser, would you like to uh, say anything about uh, what you've heard and whether you'd like to, to add anything to your previous remarks? Just in a couple of minutes, please. Yeah, well, I think that uh, all what has been said by my fellow panelists is a, is a note of hope and demonstrates that we are uh, moving in the right direction. We, it demonstrates also there's, uh, that there's a lot of work ahead, but uh, there is the, the necessary courage and willingness to, uh, to undertake the, the efforts. Uh, I, noted the, I noted the serious dimension of, in the debates, which is the regional collaboration. I agree that this is a core component of our journey together. Um, and I would just uh, like to highlight the uh, Marrakesh pledge that we launched in the COP22, which is a call for all African exchanges and regulators to act together for, for fostering the, the emergence of, uh, of sustainable finance in the continent. Uh, that's all. Thank you very much. And thanks to all the panelists and participants. 
Thank you, yes, very much. And Nicola, how about you? Anything from you? Yeah, thanks, Mark. And yeah, thanks to the panelists, because I think, um, you know, the enthusiasm, I think, has been great. And I think the panel overall, I think, was a good representation in terms of how, you know, collaboration between different stakeholders can look like um, for, for, for private finance. I've also been struck, I guess, by the need for kind of regional, you know, cooperation, but also, I think, to my earlier point about, you know, recognizing, obviously, also the differences between countries in terms of, you know, how, how we have to address um, uh, climate change. And then I think the, the last point, I think, uh, going back to the point around the need for green investment, you know, uh, across sectors, um, as, as we've heard, you know, transport, for example, as just mentioned by 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 Peter and also the increased need for investment in in adaptation and resilience, given how you know vulnerable these these markets are. So I think it's been a great panel, and yeah, thanks to Mark and and the team and the rest of the panel. Great, thank you, Nicola. Uh, Emmanuel, any any reflections on on the conversation we've been having? Yes, uh, thanks, uh, Mark. I think it's been a very exciting uh, uh, session, and, and all the panelists have been actually very uh, upfront with uh, very important information. Uh, well, I congratulate Kenya ahead of the issuance of the sovereign bond. And I uh, want to emphasize that we have a strong relationship with Morocco uh, at the FC Forest. We have an MOU with the Casablanca Finance City Authority to drive uh, uh, renewable energy development in Nigeria and address the electricity need. But just also mention that FMDQ actually is planning to launch a dedicated green exchange and uh, so watch out, you heard it first from, from me, watch out for that space. Um, FMDQ inspired FC4S and uh, Lagos and is going to also set up a dedicated exchange for only green instruments, listings, quotations, trading, you know, re reporting on green instruments. That's to show our commitment to building a new green economy in Nigeria. So thanks to all the panelists, thanks to you, Mark, and to CBI. And I hope to also uh, work with my colleagues here on the panel on that African coalition for green. I Thanks. am very much looking forward to it. Thank you. Brilliant. Good stuff. Thank you, Emmanuel. Manisha, uh, one minute from you. Thank you, Mark. Um, well, um, just to conclude by saying that we've got a very exciting report forthcoming with FSD. Um, with Mark, we'd encourage you to look at it. Um, climate finance, particularly from multilateral climate funds, is not meeting the needs of the cities. Private sector investment is the solution. And there is no dearth of private sector investment. So our report has identified um, highly possible financial instruments that can support all types of cities to draw in private sector investment. I won't give away much, would encourage you to read it and engage with us on it um, when the report is released. Thank you, Manisha. A teaser from, from uh, Manisha there, but much appreciated. And Peter, um, a final word from you. Um, anything more to announce? You're on mute. Good, good, good. Yes, thanks for putting up experience panelists across the globe. But my final word is that the journey has just started. We need to double our efforts. We need to move. Yep. Africa, with the support of Africa FSD, and also the UK government and others, we are on the right pedestal. We should not sound uh, a little bit gloomy. We are front runners. We need to keep the space. We need to double our ambition. We need to show the way. And as government, we will go where private sector fears that there is risk. And as government, if any, whatever police is needed, we will be able, we will be doing it. I've worked with the sovereign green bond in the national treasuries. Those who have worked in the bureaucratic national treasuries, it is not a walk in the park. But finally, we are moving in. Fantastic. Congratulations. Let's keep up. I invite Morocco, Nigeria to join Kenya in enhancing the Africa Green Finance Coalition as a peer review mechanism for our EU not to be crying and begging. We can get it done through the peer reviews and scale up our large-scale sustainable green finance through the markets which you have. Thank you very much. Peter, thank you uh, so much, and thank you to all the panelists. I mean, I guess, I guess, uh, I'm obviously not going to sum things up, but but I guess 
maybe a, a theme from those those final remarks from everybody is that there is so much to do, um, but let's do something uh, above all. Um, and I think there is much that we can do um, and we can do better. Let's not get overwhelmed by the scale of the challenge and pick off the things that we can do, but let's really grip those and, uh, and make something happen. So I would like to say thank you so much to, to everybody again and to CBI and wish everybody um, a fantastic uh, rest of the conference. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you very much, Mark, for good work.